Rome, the Eternal City. From the ancient Romans, through the Renaissance, and up until today, Rome has been a cultural centre. The Vatican city-state is at the centre of one of the world's great religions. It's also a treasure house of European art and learning. The spring of 1994 saw the completion of one of the largest projects undertaken by the Vatican. For 13 years, the world's attention was held by an artistic and scientific endeavour taking place in the Sistine Chapel, the restoration of the frescoes of Michelangelo. April 8, Siamo oggi nella Cappella Sistina per ammirare gli affreschi meravigliosamente restaurati. Alla conclusione di questi delicati interventi di restauro desidero ringraziare tutti voi qui presenti e particolarmente coloro che in vari modi hanno dato il loro contributo a tale mobile impresa. Si tratta di un bene culturale di This is a project of immeasurable value to all mankind. Di un bene People come from all over the world universale. to wonder at the splendor. Ci parla nella drammatica scena The last judgment is so very universale. dramatic. And this depiction of Christ Siamo is extraordinary before us. Ad un Cristo insolito. For we can see Siamo that Christ is also a man, as we are men. La di Egli verrà infatti, nella sua manità, but Christ will judge us all according to our hearts. In this figure, we can see proof of God's umane. infinite love rivelando la potenza della sua redenzione. The cultural project of the century was begun in 1981. Restoration is a difficult task. There are risks involved. One mistake and important cultural assets could be lost. So the job begins with a thorough investigation of the condition of the site by the restorers, art historians and scientists. Different disciplines with a common aim to ensure that accidents don't happen. Gianluigi Colalucci was chosen as chief restorer. Pier Giorgio Bonetti would be his assistant. As would Maurizio Rossi. Bruno Baratti would take care of a variety of miscellaneous tasks. These four men would spend 13 years hard at work on a scaffold 20 meters from the ground. Their passion for their task recalls that of Michelangelo himself as he worked at his solitary creation.
The scale of Michelangelo's masterpiece is overwhelming. On the 40-metre-long ceiling are depicted nine stories from the Old Testament book of Genesis. There are seven prophets and five sibyls on the side walls. At each of the four corners are episodes from the Old Testament, and in the Lunetta are painted the ancestors of Christ. The main altar wall is roughly 1,000 square meters in area. And here Michelangelo painted the Last Judgment, in which there are something like 400 human figures. Work to restore the frescoes began in the Lunetta. The surface was dirty and severely cracked, Nature was partly to blame, but previous attempts at restoration had done damage too. Varnish had been applied to the frescoes in order to seal the images. As it dried, it shrank and began to crack. The restoration began just in time. The first step is simply to wash the surface with a damp sponge. A special solvent was developed for the project. Known as AB57, it's a simple detergent made up mainly of ammonia and bicarbonate in water. When the surface has been sponged down, a layer of Japanese paper known as washi is applied and this is coated with AB57. The solvent dissolves the grime which is drawn into the fibrous paper. The paper is peeled off after four minutes and the surface is once again sponged down with water. While it looks and sounds simple, the technique demands a delicacy and a patience that come with years of experience. Between 60 and 70 percent of the dirt is removed through this process. The washi is used in particularly sensitive areas, otherwise the AB57 is applied directly to the surface of the fresco. Once the soot from candles and lamps has been cleaned away, the fresco's brilliant colours are revealed. Restoration a century ago meant adding colour or repainting sections. There was no concept of removing surface dirt. The fact that Michelangelo had used such brilliant hues was the first of many discoveries during this project. 500 years on, conventional wisdom had it that the artist cared little for colour. Various corrosive elements affect the frescoes. Salts dissolved in rainwater seep through the two metre thick walls and are deposited on the surface. Removing them without doing damage to the painting itself is very difficult. It's painstakingly slow work. Here, for example, the mother and child area took all of two weeks to clean up. We can understand the restoration process better if we know how a fresco is created in the first place. No. Here, at the Restorer's School, limestone and sand are made into a plaster, which is applied to a rough wall. 
da allargare che serve per tutti, eh? Comincia dall'alto, comincia dall'alto, dall'alto. Ragazzi, non ti larghe, larghe, forza, dai. A sketch of the painting, known as the cartone, is applied to the plaster. Then, while the plaster is still wet, the colour is applied. In fact, Michelangelo, in the Lunetta especially, dispensed with the cartone. At this stage, the most important factor is to set the colour into the plaster before it dries. Once it has, the colour is fast. No amount of washing at the surface will remove it. To determine the kind of pigmentation Michelangelo used in the Sistine, minute samples were taken from various points in each fresco. The restoration was backed up by strict scientific research. All important data were recorded for posterity. Color samples were sent to the Vatican's research laboratory for analysis. The results showed that Michelangelo relied on 10 pigments from which he created a multitude of colors. In addition, we learned that he avoided pigments which had any lead content. Perhaps he knew that leaded pigments deteriorate quickly. The same laboratory also analyzed the water that had been used to clean the frescoes to check for any soluble colors. In July 1982, another discovery. It was a bristle from one of Michelangelo's brushes. Evidence, perhaps, that he was working at speed. He was under great pressure from the Pope to finish the ceiling. Once the frescoes were cleaned, the restorers set about to repair damaged areas. An infrared camera proved invaluable in this task. The camera helped the restorers identify the inner areas that needed repair. The original surface could be left untouched. Bruno Baratti was given the job of reinforcing the frescoes. He uses an adhesive sealant and removes any metal clips used in previous restoration attempts. At this point, he doesn't have enough experience to do the delicate washing. In many ways, the restorer's work is similar to that of a physician, checking the condition, identifying the problem, providing a remedy. Summer 1983. Another discovery, a handprint in the plaster, believed to be that of Michelangelo. Did he place it here deliberately or had he lost his balance? 
è stata trovata una, l'impronta de, di una parte della, del palmo. The lunetta have been considered dark and dull, depictions of a dead world. However, in the course of the restoration, it was revealed that Michelangelo had kept to the tradition of the Florentine artists and had used brilliant color combinations. More than that, he experimented with color to bring additional depths to his painting. Another aspect of Michelangelo's genius lies in the sketch. Plaster dries quickly, and it's generally believed a sketch is essential. But Michelangelo didn't bother with them. He could complete a human figure within a day without using a sketch. The last lunetta are finally cleaned up. But they're somewhat more tricky than the others that have gone before. The soot is more ingrained. But here again, discovery. Removing the layers of previous restorers, Colalucci revealed a breast. The tender scene is presented as Michelangelo intended. In the Lunetta, Michelangelo depicted the ancestors of Christ. What is remarkable is the honesty he brought to the paintings. Autumn 1984. The Lunetta are restored. The restorers moved their attention to the ceiling itself. The figure of Noah had suffered some structural damage. Certain parts were missing. Bruno Baratti was given the task of reinforcing the plaster. the prophet Zachariah. Restoration here was complicated because Michelangelo himself had added paint after the original fresco had dried. Later restorers had made their own additions. Non 
The restorers used cellophane to trace the figure of Zachariah to try and work out where additions had been made by previous restorers and to record also where cracks have appeared. The shoulder here was not Michelangelo's original. In fact, Zachariah proved to be the figure on which most changes had been made. For example, the shadows behind his clothing, they were soon removed. And there were anatomical details too. The most outstanding change was in the prophet's beard. Earlier restorers simply added paint according to their imaginations. What started out as a four-year plan actually took five years to complete. The results speak for themselves. At the same time, restoration work began on the Delphic Civil. This is often said to be the most beautiful female image in the Sistine. A prophet in ancient Greece, she presided over the most authoritative of the oracles at Delphi, centuries before the birth of Christ, and thus has no direct connection with the Testaments. In portraying her, it's thought Michelangelo was stressing the fact that everyone, even the heathens, could know the grace of God. Slowly, slowly, the Delphic Sibyl is restored to its original brilliance. Throughout the project, careful records were kept by everyone involved. Every day, after the work was finished, Colalucci made careful notes. The work of the restorer is difficult. If he succeeds in his task, the credit goes to the original artist. If he makes a mistake, the responsibility is his. Restoration of the Delphic Sibyl is almost complete. 
This is the figure which some scholars have said typifies Michelangelo's vision of woman. It's repeated in his paintings and his sculptures. February 1988, a high point in the project. God creating man in his own image is one of the most powerful and well-known of Michelangelo's images. The powerful figure of the Almighty approaches Adam. Both figures reach out with their hands, and from the finger of God, Adam receives life. It is an exquisite composition, the awesome moment of creation captured with such compassion by Michelangelo. Michelangelo recorded how he was forced to bend over like a bow in order to paint the ceiling. Colalucci would no doubt sympathize. To what looks like a very simple task, Colalucci and his colleagues bring invaluable knowledge and experience. Their common goal, to restore Michelangelo's work to its finest. To do that, they must understand exactly how he worked. For example, how he played with light and shadow. The technique known as chiaroscuro in such images as the creation of Adam. Virtually all of Michelangelo's paintings feature the human form. The figures are made more lifelike through the careful application of this technique. To this painting, Michelangelo brought his remarkable talent for observation, perfected through his work as a sculptor. The point at which the fingers almost touch was left until last in the cleaning process. Colalucci worked with infinite care. When the work was finished, it was as if the moment of creation was repeated all over again. It was 1988, and we could glimpse the true genius of what Michelangelo had created 500 years before. And God blessed them, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. man's relationship to God and God's unfailing love for mankind. These abiding themes in Michelangelo's art are brought together here as never before. In December 1989, after five years' work and one year behind schedule, the work on the ceiling was finished.
Michelangelo began work on The Last Judgment in 1535, 23 years after he'd completed the Sistine ceiling. He was 60 years old and the task would take him six years. In the autumn of 1990, the daunting task of restoring The Last Judgment was begun. The Last Judgment is the final act in the human drama and Michelangelo peopled it with some 400 figures. In composition and in style, this work is a departure from conventional Renaissance form, and it provoked both anger and admiration in Rome. No doubt Michelangelo was influenced by his resistance to the Reformation, the movement began in Germany in 1517. Subsequent events began to change Renaissance thinking and Michelangelo's own art was definitely affected. In The Last Judgment, he deviates from realism and faithful perspective. Nevertheless, his message succeeds in overwhelming the viewer. Because of the particular conditions, the restorers decided to use a different solvent on the Last Judgment, one based on ammonia. They also decided to use washi all across the wall. On the ceiling, it had been used only on particular spots. By the time he embarked on this work, Michelangelo's technique had become really delicate. Equally delicate computer technology was used by the restorers to ensure work on the Last Judgment could go ahead safely and smoothly. The restoration started at the upper part of the painting with the angels. At this point, Bruno Baratti joined the others in the cleaning work. The project so far had been a true learning experience for him. Work on the angels was completed to reveal that Michelangelo did not give them wings. To create the perfectly blue sky, the artist had used expensive lapis lazuli. We can only speculate what the Pope of the day had expected when faced with such costs. Public expectations of the restoration project were also mixed. The critics were divided between those who felt that colour must have been added and those who argued that layers of Michelangelo's own additions were being removed. But over time, the results of the restorer's efforts spoke for themselves to satisfy all but the most severely critical. Other questions were addressed too. Why, for example, does St. Peter appear so distressed?
the object of the exercise was to restore the paintings to their original form, based on scientific and artistic research, so that they might be preserved for generations to come. The project also offered rich opportunities for study. The damned, what horrors do they face, what fear? Microscopic examinations detected where paint might have been added or where cracks have appeared. In March 1992, the restorers began work on the section of the wall in which Michelangelo depicted hell. Arrivals there are greeted by Minos, legendary king of Crete. Michelangelo gave him the face of the Vatican's chief of protocol, who'd been critical of the artist's use of nudity in the chapel. This part of the Last Judgment was the hardest to clean, being closest to the altar lamps and candles, the soot and grime were thicker than anywhere else. It's been claimed that Michelangelo deliberately dulled his work in this area. This restoration process has shattered that myth forever. Minos appears shiningly, as if illuminated by hell fire itself. And there would be further surprises here before the project was complete. July 1993. Time to contemplate the restoration of the figure of Christ. Michelangelo obviously went to great pains in creating this figure. He used special pigments and repainted several areas. The results surprised and shocked many of his contemporaries. Here was the savior of man with the body of Hercules and the face of Apollo. Conservatives were outraged. Why, they demanded to know, was Christ depicted so, brawny, young, almost human? And why, perhaps above all why, was he naked? An inquiry found in favour of Michelangelo, and the figure of Christ was left untouched and unclothed. The restored Christ's hair shines golden. The dark shadow of his beard line is gone. Spirituality radiates from him. The same spirituality Michelangelo believed worked through him.
The last problem to be faced by the restorers was which loincloths should be removed. They put off a decision until the beginning of 1994. Uh, in, uh... Analysis of the paints used in the loincloths allowed us to identify when they had been added to the figures. Some were done in the 1700s. Others date back to the 1500s. We chose to leave those of the 1500s and to remove those done in the 18th century. We think this allows us a true picture of what Michelangelo intended. In The Last Judgment, the angels, the saints and the damned were depicted as naked figures. Michelangelo believed that is how God intended beauty to appear. The Council of Trent saw things differently and instructed that clothing should be applied to each figure. A pupil of Michelangelo was hired to begin painting loincloths. Over the years more were added until at the end of the 18th century there had been 40 additions. Of these, the restorers removed all but 17. They were able to remove the additions without damaging the original frescoes because they'd been made using pigments that did not soak into the original fabric. Among the figures to be unclothed was that of the central doomed figure, a master stroke in The Last Judgment, which expresses so strongly the concept of human despair. To the restorer's great surprise, the figure was revealed to be female, whereas for centuries it had been considered male. Similarly, the removal of the loincloth that had been added to Minos led to another surprise. Similarly, the removal of the loincloth that had been added to Minos led to another surprise. As the cleaning process removed the flimsy garment, it became apparent that the serpent that was wound around him was biting at his private parts. Michelangelo had taken as his model for Minos the Vatican's chief of protocol, who had been so critical of the use of nudity. In this single gesture, the artist summed up his contempt for such hypocrisy. 
I think the restoration went well. It has been done well. We accomplished something very important. The way we approached it was right. The result leaves no doubts. We have confidence that we were supported by scientific evidence and we repaired errors that had been committed in earlier attempts at restoration. Now the work is truly Michelangelo's. I sometimes felt the weight of such a great responsibility. But now I am at ease because we did what was right and now the restoration has put things back to the original beauty. It was done well. Colalucci retires at Christmas 1994, his 65th birthday. Rossi and Bonetti both face retirement. They began this project in their 40s. Bruno Baratti emerges as the master restorer. He alone will understand the secrets of the Sistine. April 1994. The Sistine Chapel is restored to its former glory. In this restoration, we see the genius of Michelangelo. The ceiling in his 30s, and the altar wall in his 60s. The Last Judgment is a powerful expression of the artist's vision. Its restoration is an equally powerful statement of how we see that vision today. Michelangelo's genius is evident. That of the restorers is less so, but that is as it should be.